An eerie stillness hangs in the air, as if time has come to a standstill in this grand mansion. Its few companions, the constant change of weather, and feathered friends who make their seasonal visits. But within these walls lies the century-old story of a man with valiant dreams. Dreams spun from a man's flight of fancy, inspired by his love for an heiress. Where love and romance, ambition and tragedy intertwine, leaving behind an imposing enigma that continues to be shrouded in mystery. An eerie stillness hangs in the air, as if time has come to a standstill in this grand mansion. Its few companions, the constant change of weather, and feathered friends who make their seasonal visits. But within these walls lies the century-old story of a man with valiant dreams. Dreams spun from a man's flight of fancy, inspired by his love for an heiress. Where love and romance, ambition and tragedy intertwine, leaving behind an imposing enigma that continues to be shrouded in mystery. Once dubbed the City of Millionaires, Ipo is also known as a city built on tin. Towards the end of the 19th century, an influx of migrants and entrepreneurs made this the largest tin-producing region in the world. As the British Empire expanded its colonial government in Malaya, men from China, India and Europe came in droves looking for opportunities. Perhaps it was the drive to escape from the droll of poverty that brought a poor young farmer, Scotsman William Smith, to this faraway land in search of a better life. He came in 1890 to make his fortune, as many people from the home countries did, because Malaya was opening up. And there were lots of opportunities for them in tin mining, rubber planting, and also on. Only 20, William Smith had ambitious plans to build his fortune. He met fellow European Charles Alma Baker, who had won a few government contracts to build roads and railway tracks in South Para. With Ipo starting to bustle as a trading town, and many business opportunities readily available, William soon made a profit from the building contracts. And with the money, he purchased some land just south of Ipo. The young man had bigger dreams. He wanted to be a planter, the erstwhile term for plantation owners. At that time, the colonial government was very generous in giving out land to European settlers who wanted to plant. At the beginning, it was coffee. Uh, in the 1890s, it was coffee. And uh, Kelly Smith applied and got about 3,000 acres of land around Bargaija to plant coffee. And he was also given mining concessions to dredge. 
and to, to prospect for tin. But the coffee business did not take off. As with many other estate owners in the late 1890s, William switched to a new plantation crop, rubber. With his business empire gaining momentum, William started to build a name for himself in the British social circles in Para. But misfortune soon struck, and William had to leave the country immediately. He received news from Scotland that his mother was very ill, so he had to go back quite suddenly to see her. And on the way back from Scotland, he met Agnes on board the ship coming to Penang. Agnes was coming out east for the first time, and uh, she must have been captiva captivated by William Kelly Smith. He was tall, uh, ha handsome, young, and uh, she must have been swept off the feet. They had a ship bought romance, and they got married. In remembrance of his late mother, William took on her maiden name and called himself William Kelly Smith. He returned to Malaya in 1903 with his new bride, Agnes. Agnes was an heiress who came from a rich cotton family in England and due to inherit 300,000 pounds from her trustees in 1906. But William wanted his young wife to have everything she desired in this foreign land. He transferred some of his rubber estate to his wife's name, making her its owner, and made plans to further develop it. Kelly Smith got a loan from a Chinese company in Singapore to advance her $24,000 a year for three years until she received the money from trustees. And the first thing he did was to build her the present house here. He built a Moorish-style manor and called it Kalas House, which bore some resemblances to his small home in Scotland. The manor sat on a little knoll just by the bend of Kinta River, commanding a clear, unobstructed view of his rubber estate, Kinta Kalas. William and Agnes's early months of conjugal life continued to be a courtship, heady with romance. The adoring couple had a baby girl in the second year of marriage, and they named her Helen. But behind the tender love they found in each other, Agnes was finding it difficult to live in Colas House. Used to the temperate weather in England, Agnes longed for a cooler climate to raise her child comfortably. The weather was very hot for her. So it was mentioned that she went off to stay near to the British people in Bukit Maxwell, Taiping. But uh, the wife to stay with him, therefore he has promised her that I'll build you a house as big as a castle that resembles his love. William had ambitious plans for his family's new home but more money was needed to build the extension on the grounds of Kalas House. Agnes thought they would be able to use her inheritance to fund the construction, but was told by her trustees that the money could only be released later in 1908. Their grand plans had gone awry. So they had to turn to the government for a loan of $50,000. Finally, they only gave them $10,000. So Kelly Smith had no choice but to sell part of the estate to get the money. With the money he received from the land sale, William started planning the construction of their palatial residence. William was determined to keep his promise to his beloved wife, who was beginning to miss England greatly. William Kelly Smith had a lot to celebrate. He had a devoted wife, a loving family, and a burgeoning business. And he was about to lay the foundation for what he envisioned as a magnificent colonial mansion, a love gift. 
He looked beyond the shores of Malaya and went as far as South India to hire skilled artisans and building laborers. But what William Kelly didn't know was that this visit to India would soon bring a new addition to his family. அப்பொழுது அவர்கள் மகா மாரியம்மன் என்ற ஒரு சிர ஆலயத்தை இந்த வாசலில் வைத்து வணங்கி வந்தார்கள் அப்பொழுது இந்த கெலியஸ் என்பவர் இந்த வாசலுக்கு ஒரு நாள் வந்திருந்தார் வந்திருக்கும்போது அவருக்கு பெண் குழந்தைகள் தான் ஆண் குழந்தைகள் கிடையாது அப்பொழுது அங்கே அந்த பக்தர்கள்லாம் அவரிடம் முறையிட்டிருக்கார் இந்த ஒரு கோயிலுக்கு நீங்கள் கோயில் கட்டி கொடுத்தால் உங்களுக்கு நிச்சயம் ஆண் குழந்தை பறக்கும் என்று சொல்லியிருக்கின்றார்கள் மனசார அவர் தரிசனம் செய்து சென்றிருக்கின்றார் Eleven years after they had their first child, both Agnes and William were blessed with a son, Anthony. The happy father finally commissioned the start of construction at the new manor in 1915. As the edifice took shape, it was obvious that this would be no ordinary mansion. When completed, it was to have some resemblance to an English castle and would feature a six-story tower, a wine cellar, and stately columns with Moorish-style arches and windows. William even had plans for the walls of the rooms to be decorated with Greco-Roman designs and a bucket lift, which would have been a first in Malaya. He must have got this of the architecture from the UK, from Scotland, and um, from India, from colonial India. So it's like a very eclectic style of conferences of things that he liked, I think. You know, he would have visited these places, he would have made notes, you know, done drawings, I'm sure. And he went back and told the people that this is the style that I want. ambitious plan for the castle extended to its grounds, which were to be groomed into pockets of open spaces and lawns, and connected to the original house by a covered walkway. But just as progress was well underway, tragedy struck. A mysterious flu-like illness swept through the area, killing many of William's Indian workers. <coughs> the survivors told their master that a Hindu temple must be built immediately to placate the gods. If not, decimating their numbers. There was a disease known as Spanish uh, flu that uh, kills most of his workers. So being a very superstitious man, what he did is that he sent the balance of the workers right, to the present site where the Indian temple is, which is about uh, 500 meters away from Kelly's castle, uh, to build the Indian temple. The temple took a few years to build, and work on the castle was temporarily halted. With the erection of the temple, the epidemic mysteriously disappeared. In a mark of gratitude to their employer, the devoted laborers sculptured an effigy of William Kelly on the roof of the temple, alongside the deities from the Hindu pantheon. The man had won the hearts of his employees with his compassion. The Ulagatilel Pata or Sami Nude Uruvangal Tan over the Lirikin Rikamendum. Other Avrode Yenas in the Nailandre, Teriamal, Avrode Uruvate in the Vasalil, Aitirkin Tar, Nafagarta Maha, Ana or Sandadi Lunde, Urula Manitrale. After completion of the temple, building work resumed at the castle. In the long years that transpired in the construction of the castle, 
William was increasingly consumed by the need to create a masterpiece that was unique and monumental. More details were added, adopting Moorish influences with a turreted staircase and arches that spoke of his travels to various countries. There were even flying buttresses on the outside of the building, each adorned with images of William Kelly and his family. It was built as a romantic endeavor, but it wasn't something I'm sure he did, you know, instantaneously. In those days, it takes a long time to build. It's taken some time to plan it, some time to design it, some time to do some research on it, and then to assemble all the builders and the craftsmen. I can imagine somebody building something as big as that, as a work of love for, as an object of love for a woman. Um, I mean, how love for women, you know? A letter is not enough, you know? Maybe words are not enough. You know, a building is, is tangible. The physical manifestation of love for Agnes was a sight to behold. A luxurious Victorian residence, positioned at the top of a hill, overlooking a vast rubber estate of lush vegetation. William Kelly and Agnes spent many blissful days with their family, watching their new home evolve, slowly and grandly. Their love abode was the envy of many, as its size and grandeur surpassed even that of the British residence house in North Para. But William wasn't just building a home for his family. He was ingeniously contributing to the enigma that would, decades later, imbue the premises. Today, the sleepy town of Batu Gaja belies the glory years of an affluent era. William Kelly became one of the biggest planters in the area, accumulating much respect and recognition in society. And to celebrate his success, William included plans in the building of the castle for a rooftop courtyard area where he could entertain. Kinta society at that time was a brilliant society. People were rich. There was a tin boom, there was a rubber boom, and uh, a lot of the Europeans were millionaires. And they, there, was, there were always parties, and uh, you know, uh, she had governesses for the children. They went back home on leave very often, and uh, they were living in a grand style. And uh, Kelly Smith wanted a house that was grand enough for, to accommodate that type of lifestyle. When William's son, Anthony, was about nine, it was decided that he would go to England for a boarding school education. Agnes left Malaya with Anthony in 1924, and William stayed on with his daughter, Helen. Two years later, as the building was nearing completion, William placed an order for the elevator. He went back to England to visit his family and to ship back the lift. That was the last time William Kelly Smith saw his love castle. On his way back, he had to go to Lisbon to finalize the details of a big concession that he had got from the Portuguese government. And uh, it was mid-winter, he caught cold and uh, developed into pneumonia, and he died in Lisbon in 1926. His distraught wife was heartbroken. The memories of living with her husband in their conjugal home were too much to bear. Agnes was unable to complete the castle's construction and run her husband's businesses from England. She made the painful decision of selling the land to a large British trading firm.
Agnes never returned to Malaya. With the ravages of time and nature, a valiant dream turned to tumbled masonry. As the years went by, encroaching foliage enveloped the castle, almost erasing its former glory. Those days, this whole place was covered with trees. It's a jungle. And the castle also was covered with creepers. And then there were other trees growing on the walls and so on. It used to be a place where my friends and I would come during the holidays to spend a day here and enjoy ourselves. Perhaps it was the lingering spirit of love that rubbed off on the curious visitors, as some years later, Ho's childhood friend became his wife. But it's not just stories of love that swirled around the castle. Tales of speculation and superstition further fueled the mystery of the mansion. But I used to know a lady who would come here every Friday night. Taxi driver will bring her, she'll sleep in the, one of the rooms for the night and ask for numbers. So I think she lost her fortune here rather than strike, strike it rich. <laughs> Kelly's castle is as misunderstood as it is enigmatic. Some even believe it is haunted with sightings of strange apparitions. Perhaps this unfinished symphony still attracts the colonial master himself, who finds it difficult to leave a dream that was never realized. This place is active and it's a residual haunting which happens over and over again. So uh, the situation that took place many, many years back, it's been repeating here over and over again. I've seen uh, some unexplainable things, for example, uh, quite a tall guy, you know, in a uh, European guy, because the way, by the look in it, with a hat on. But the moment when I go against this figure, it slowly begins to uh, disappear, you know. We paranormal researchers believe that during the full moon and the new moon, those are the time the geomagnetic field of the Earth is very high. Therefore, for them to appear in a much more resemblance uh, form, it's more easier for them. But that doesn't mean that they're not here all the time. They are here exactly how they used to be the last time. It's just that our perception to know whether are they there or not. The effort and uh, those emotional love that he has before his wife and all, those things actually we carry when we go to the spiritual realm. It doesn't go away. It's like an emotional baggage, you know. If like, for example, if you love something in this uh, current physical life and you move on to the uh, spiritual world, you still carry those kind of characteristics with you. He might have come to a faraway, unknown land, looking to make his fortune. But with his indomitable spirit and vision, William Kelly Smith created an edifice, one which still whispers of a special love story between a man and a woman. Thank you.